no further ado, please welcome Morris Manning. As the uh, late, great Minnie Pearl was famous for saying, howdy. Um, thank you, Wyatt and Barbara, for making my time in this program such a joy um, and a, a gift that I puzzle on all the time. Thank you to colleagues, wonderful staff, folks in our great workshop, worldlings. Um, I have a new book coming out in a couple of months, and I'm just going to start. I've never read these poems, so I'm totally freaked out. <laughs> um, the book is called Rail Splitter. Reflections on the Art of Poetry Composed in the Posthumous Voice of Honest Abe Lincoln, Former Prez U.S. <laughs> I'm just, I also don't have this in the easily to, easy to manage form, so pardon all the shuffling. Um, I don't, I don't want to do a lot of explaining either, so I'm just going to start reading poems. And if you th think this is going off the rails, someone please hold up a hand and say, stop. <laughs> Lincoln's, uh, Lincoln was our most literate president, even though he went to school for less than a year. He memorized whole poems, whole passages of Shakespeare, um, memorized poems by Robert Burns, Thomas Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard, etc. And at times of crisis, which there were many in his career, he would whip out a passage of poetry that he had memorized and say it to himself to bring clarity to his thought. To a chigger. <laughs> oh, itchy beast of tiny figure, when I scratched myself, I made you bigger. Though you began as but a chigger, you redder rose, a pistol butt without a trigger, thus we were foes. In armpit high or ankle lower, you left me last to be the knower that you were first to be the goer where sweat may trickle, and I was felled as by a mower with scythe and sickle. Though felled, hyperbolize is true, the minor wounds I got from you, the itchiness I felt undue, a fierce attacking I never would have dreamed to woo from one so lacking. Yet me you often so infested, I felt my life had been divested, and bitterness I had ingested in the hotter days of youth when meaning is contested in lofty ways, but in age and temperament I seasoned, and with your kind I learned and reasoned, as an older dog contends with fleas and resolves the pest, deserves its life, though it has treasoned and takes his rest. You are a bug of southern climes, yet strangely strode all through my times, symbolically, a bell whose chimes in turn are grating, refusing love to find that rhymes are dull negating. Animadversion. I liked to fiddle with the Latin words and imagine how they arrived in English, awkwardly, because the mother tongue was dead and her survivors came as immigrants plucked from the boats of books to be re-rendered by Shakespeare, to over-decorate a suspicious speech, persuasion as gold leaf to gild the convolutions of a mind driven by greed 
or revenge or banality. The commoner standing in the pit could hear how the device tightened the drama as the words came flowing from the actor's mouth smoother than any flow of nature and therefore sufficient cause to doubt the speech and whatever virtue the actor claimed. So, language is a means of pure deception and the inadvertent revelation of the truth in the bare knuckles of the words after a dramatic circumstance has whittled down the flowered phrase. Romance and reason, piss and gall. The language accommodates our contradictions, our divided selves, and he who claims never to be divided, whose melancholy never makes war with his happiness, whose malice never seeds to charity, will be surprised when the drama turns the mind against itself and the metaphor approaches but never arrives at justice. This is true in the churchyard elegy of Gray, the mix of elegy and yard, of the high unending tone and the unknown end, the unfathomed meaning of a life, to give the unknown poor the dignity of time transforms the meaning of time. To say these people in the ground were poets whose verses are lost is deeply something to live with because it prompts beyond, because it points beyond the reach of any language and the mind should not be easily turned from such a prospect or else the heart objects to pity. If you're brushed up on your American history from the late 1850s, you probably recall there were a number of bad decisions made by the Supreme Court and the Senate. This is reference to one of them. Upon the Wilmot Proviso, very well. I contradict myself according to the circumstance. I'll not deny recorded facts, nor seek to justify positions I didn't take, yet later took. Conscience has its little limbo, the realm where the soul of a thought is stuck, forever lodged in history. If one would strive to be in the right, yet nevertheless be in the wrong, what then? I know no deist scheme or transcendental light to lead the way from such predicament. Yet to deny the wrong is wrong. A wrong may be forgiven, but denial of the wrong implies there is no wish to be forgiven. How many men go to their graves believing they were in the right? Mythologies are built on this, actions and consequences and bends in the truth to cover original sin. A man who believes he stands above the law has not sufficiently studied the law of either God or man. This is the sort of proclamation I'd say to myself when confronting my wrongs, but even that wasn't enough to wash blood from my hands or free me to enter the country of redemption, if such a place exists at all, unblemished. Like a long shadow, my compromises have followed me to an afterlife far longer than my life. A brief refutation of the rumor that I allowed Willie and Tad to relieve themselves in my upturned hat on a Sunday morning at the office while their mother was attending religious services. <laughs> I will allow a tall hat can be put to purposes other than the polite covering of the head. And the record shows I carried papers in mine. 
Important papers, too, and for dramatic effect, I'd pull them out in court, bewildering my opponents. But that was practical. The documents intended to prove my claim were sheltered from the weather and less likely to be lost. And having words I'd taken care to write proximate to the head from which they sprang <laughs> permitted me to ponder them, to keep them, so to speak, in the nest a little longer before they flew into the room to batter against the smudged windows of a prairie courthouse amid the clangs of the punctuating spittoon. <laughs> it was a commonplace to fill my hat with oats and feed my horse when I was riding on the circuit. And the rooming houses where I lodged had few accommodations, so the hat was handy as a basin if a morning ablution were required. On this occasion, however, the hat was mere amusement for the boys who set it on the office floor and pitched pennies into it, stepping farther back each round as I was reading on the couch. Their mother was indeed at church. The weather was profoundly cold and the privy regrettably distant from the office. <laughs> so, Boys being boys with a famously permissive father, I agreed to let them use my boot. <laughs> Good boy. Um, one, one of the farms where Lincoln lived as a child in Kentucky was called Knob Creek for the stream that runs through the neighborhood. Knob Creek. It watered the farm on three sides, gracing the field, my mother said, and nearly crossed itself in place after place for several miles before it emptied into Rolling Fork. If you were walking along the creek and looked across the way, you could see exactly where you'd be after another mile or two of walking. Over there would be an hour later where you committed to follow the creek. The future wandered through the valley, winding like a snake in the grass. One day when we were planting pumpkins, I looked across the bottom and saw a couple of white men marching seven slaves chained together. The slaves were singing to pass the time. One of the white men was afraid to cross a body of water, so all of the party walked on the western bank and wound along the creek for hours. They kept appearing and reappearing as they went upstream but going south. There wasn't a bridge. There wasn't a bridge. Gracing the field, my mother said, and now I've mentioned Old Knob Creek as if it's gone away. It ain't. Transcendentalism. One of the things the actor's bullet failed to do was to interrupt the rhythm of thought the flow of the mind as it moves around an encumbrance or wears it down as water patiently tames a rock and may in time pass through it freely. Contemplation is all there is of the afterlife. The mind continues steadily, not seeking decision or destination, unable to rest and yet at ease because the thought is always lulling back and forth as a boat gently rocking, following the rhythm of the world. Raindrops dripping off the eave are keeping eternal time. The capacity of the mind is oceanic. It laps and swells and subsides. The sun flares out of it and then extinguishes itself in the dark waters of thought, the divine ditty of the universe, 
the endless inner pitter-patter. The new Madrid earthquake happened when uh, Lincoln was three. And that's what this is about loosely. The sound of the earth conversing. Mother was certain God was coming for us, and the trumpet of the end of time had sounded, deafeningly blown by a band of angels. In the morning, Father went outside to report the scarecrow had toppled over, an arm was sticking up, and a crow had lighted on it. It was the winter, and the field was barren. I remember watching a log roll out of the fire and roll back in again, repeatedly, until it rested on the coals and blazed to light as if it had never moved, and then around daybreak, it happened again. We heard a hillside of shale slide down the western ridge. By now, we were all outside to watch, and Father joked that a shorter ridge would surely mean a longer day, more time, and a chance to raise the place a peg or two closer to real prosperity. But that condition ever remained a stranger to us. Three times the bowl of our little valley shook and trembled many more, and the sound went around as if the heavens themselves were crying out, the last of these convulsions coinciding with the day to mark my third year living. The little cabin bounced with the earth, yet stood, because, as Father said, it was designed to move. Lap joints, pegs, and notches, not a nail anywhere to make it stiff. Reckoning now, if God himself was the shaker, I'm not inclined to call it punishment. I'm not inclined to call it anything, even if church bells in Boston rang, suggesting a joy or a grief had come to the land, for maybe only the earth was shaking itself. Lincoln's uh, law partner, longest serving law partner was a fellow named Billy Herndon. He called him Little Billy, not to Billy's pleasure. <laughs> Little Billy Herndon, reading the law. Why, bless its heart, his mama said and smacked the back of Billy's head. A lawyer man must stand up tall, but honey, you're a tad bit small. Perhaps another line you'll choose or fetch a taller pair of shoes. I fear you'll wind up with that fool who never went a year to school. Fancy dress ball. There once was a man named Herndon who fell for a gal that spurned him. They bowed at the dance there endeth romance, but nevertheless it burned him. <laughs> Writs, claims, statutes, deeds. Like me, ordained by the emptiness of Kentucky, removed like me to the emptiness of the prairie, and both of us standing before the emptiness, the physical and metaphysical, believing surely something is in both, a cause, a purpose, uneasy, steady friendship, thoughts to keep to ourselves, a world to make, philosophy, geometry to ponder, and everywhere poetry to savor, and even matchless Billy, a joke to tell. Lincoln belonged to a, an organization in Springfield, Illinois, as a very young man called the Young Men's Lyceum, where these uncouth bumpkin guys would get together and pretend to give speeches. <laughs> Young Men's Lyceum. Consider 
a high Hellenic scene in Athens and move it to a prairie town 2,000 years later and see what happens. Young men trying to improve themselves before civilization catches up with them. It was comedic, an imitation of intelligence and manner, a parody unaware of various Shakespeare scenes. No Socrates of the wild frontier to lead us. So we led ourselves, imperfectly at first. Dramatic recitation shows, orations followed by debate, rightness and eloquence of phrase and pause to sharpen a point with subtlety, then stop to let it linger in the air. What were we seeking? Polish? Praise? Of course, but we were learning the English language, misusing words in order later to use them to greater effect, to clarify through metaphor, to make a line as plumb as the carpenter's bob against the wall of reason in the event that reason in the world should be discovered to be lacking. And we're assembled to raise the barn. Learning the language deeply shapes the mind, and there in the lighted mind was freedom. No government could take away, and no mob could overrule. What we began in innocence in a dusty tavern room was our deliverance from evil. The journey was poetic, filled with scenes whose pathos was both stark and pleasing. An admirable rhythm was also to be detected as if accompanied by a river. I don't know if you can tell there's some formal stuff going on. <laughs> Meter, um, couplets. This is a curtailed sonnet. By God, I was a sly gesticulating fool, unfolding myself to rise in court required a rousing double jerk that ever proved to startle the clerk and the judge when I rose from a chair too short to sail as a ship listing to port. And then I'd add flamboyant quirks employed that an anecdote might work. Why, I'd tug the whiskers on my wart. All for emphasis to make my homely body homelier and let my right hand be a wrench to the left to loosen the tail and take a mooring sharply at the pier, unloading reason at the bench. This is the longest poem in the book. Some of you know uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Um, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming. Well, very soon after it entered um, um, our culture, Union soldiers parodied it. And um, one version of that was John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. Another verse, we will hang Jeff Davis from a sour apple tree. There's a, yet another iteration of the parody called John Brown's baby has a cold upon his chest. That's this poem. If the actor hadn't shot me, I might have lived like Whitman and Melville for most of my century, the first president, American born, and not from a state that had ever been a colony, the new America settled ahead of law and reason by those who believed sincerely in the promise, whose design implied the promise, and those who took it for granted or took it for themselves, driven by greed or necessity to move the West much farther west. Up to the war, I can tell you this, 
the slave owners wished to extend a colonial system using American law to back it and cover up the sin. Now, if that doesn't sound familiar, then I'm not dead old honest Abe. Getting a law on the books means future debate will be confined to the law alone and exclude the truth, or dare I say the moral barb the law is intended to blunt or cover up. And so the law enters the books to serve deceit. You in later centuries may like to know how all of this works. I cannot see your time. I'm only permitted to see a few years beyond my own and the actor cut it short. Curious too, Whitman and Melville separately described John Brown as a meteor, a metaphor to herald the war. But here the art is also deceiving for the skies of 1859 and 60 were known for meteoric events. The gleaming shooting stars were real and all the poet had to do to find the metaphor was read the news or lazily look up in the sky. Another way to think of this is to imagine poetry was simply in the air, as John Brown would be, suspended by a rope. And by the way, the actor was there to see him hang, disguised in the blue of a U.S. uniform, to watch the old man drop and kick, a greater reality perhaps than the actor was used to, the same actor who with his brother commissioned the bronze statue of Shakespeare in Central Park. For all to see, the bard himself, presented by men who played his parts on stage and were regaled as men of great refinement. But I always took refinement lightly. And that left room for comedy, a genre you should know the actor thought was beneath his station and talent, though after murdering me in the second act of one, he leapt to the stage and broke his leg, a play within the play, which produced in my final moment of hearing, laughter. The great tragedian reduced to play a rude mechanical who blunders his Latin line hopping across the interrupted stage to exit. But the war invited comedy why ladies and gentlemen would picnic on a hill above a battle to watch the slaughter and dab their mouths with handkerchiefs. It also welcomed song, at first austere, the strident battle hymn whose truth goes marching on, so soon becoming John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, and later the farcical John Brown's baby has a cold upon his chest. The melody was easily adaptable, and the busy photographers lugging their boxes of glass plates to the field, sometimes posing the dead in genuine bathos to show the public what they were missing. Young men, poetically arranged, who moments before had been singing, reciting light verse or prayers under their breath, when the shadow of death directed the art of dying should commence at once and only the dead were unified. Learning to write with a feather. The claim my cousin offered after I died that he'd killed a buzzard for a single feather in order to bend my fingers around the quill that I might learn the shapes of letters is true. How strange that I could read almost anything and grasp it. If I read it twice aloud, I could recall it ever after, word for word. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, a line from Hamlet I used to savor, because it sounds just right, yet the meaning bounds away as the mind desiring comprehension advances. And all of this before I could write my name. For what was printed differed from what was written. It didn't occur to me in early years that reading 
was the offspring of writing, so getting ahead in reading was backing up. Though once I began with letters, I hadn't ink or money for it or paper, and furthermore, I hadn't anything of my own to say. So I copied all of Hamlet in the air, from his father's ghost on to Yorick's skull, the black feather twittering like a wren, a single feather representing the bird in full, synecdoche, I think it is. My mother, who could read but couldn't write, presented all of her person with an X. A barrel full of pickled pig's feet. I received a letter from the son of a horse doctor in Perryville who said his father was shot right through the pocket watch he drew on the page of his letter, pointing out the hands of, pointing out the hands were missing now, and the face of time had a 50 caliber hole in it. The horse doctor was a Negro, born in freedom, ironically, who lived in a village of free blacks. The Union had presently burned to prevent the enemy from shelter. They were also shooting the horses so the enemy could not escape. The horse doctor had a horse named Jupiter, or Jupe for short, who survived, and now the boy had ridden the horse to be taken in by the Shakers, and he reckoned he would doctor horses for them and their mules and oxen too, for creatures don't know enemies. An American habit is to fail to recognize the symbolism of what happens, even as what happens always is also real. The description of the scene the boy presented in his letter brought to mind a memory of looking into a barrel as a boy myself when I accompanied my father to the mercantiler wherever we were living then. Hundreds of pig's feet floated in the brine and the skim of muck covered the surface like a cataract, ca clouding an ancient eye. The hole in the watch reminded me of the eye, I guess, because I imagined the boy living to be an old man, occasionally looking through the watch to see his father there, because I liked to imagine things that touched my heart and gave me hope. I'm gonna have to jump here, sorry. The long and short of the matter. What prompts a long and skinny man to hanker for a stout woman? Indeed, a woman whose stoutness stands in marked contrast to the man's gangly, elongated frame. The history of human pairing, my own uncertain tries and erring, and even after marriage, staring into the well of wonder, despairing that such a condition wants a name. Yet, humming rhymes delightedly, I found there is a history conveyed by earthy poetry, the Jack Spratt philosophy. <laughs> so I denominated the game as if tranced and danced round in my mind, recalling Wyatt's hunt of the hind and Herrick's puns for how he finds those tremblings of different kinds. So for my love, I found the same. I died in service of the state, but the tireless cause did not abate an instinct I felt to procreate or merely heatedly to mate with Mary, short and stout, and close the daylight out. And blindly, many times to her I came. The gift of prophecy. Being shot on Good Friday was, of course, symbolic. 
and nicely fit the drama, and nicely fit the drama. And Pentecost, coming a few weeks later, as I recall, was an unintended, though moving, feature of how my tragic death would be interpreted in time. The actor had no idea what he had done, but he transformed me, made me a saint in the simple terms of American reflection. I'm not a saint. And true reflection, I've learned in the afterlight, requires a longer perspective, a lesson Americans may have to learn again and again and again. I was the 16th president born in dark, primitive emptiness, an unimaginable place that yet must be imagined if what I mean symbolically should have a meaning. What prophecy could come from such beginning? I started out from where I started. If I could see ahead, it wasn't far. I wasn't a prophet. I was a man. Always surrounding me was poetry, the tales, adventures in the land, and desire falling short of true desire, and words flung out for sound and music alone, falling down, a shallow art and young in keeping with our nature. What future lies ahead? A fine question, one to consider quietly, for now, I think I've stumbled onto something that begs a little pause for a cause. Nope, not a saint. I am an allegory, and that is why I'm still alive. Sorry, this is... Skip about 20 pages. Testament. I left my father's shadow to build a boat for a gassy, windy man, some claimed a brain-rattling man whose name was Denton Offutt. The boat and the enterprise of building it and the symbols that presented themselves reminded me of Noah's Ark, and I was Noah. Though not rain, but deep snows had melted to flood the country. There wasn't anywhere to walk in 1831, so ironically, before I built the boat, I had to reach the place where I'd agreed to build it, which meant the manner of my first entrance into Sangamon County was by canoe. It was in connection with this boat that occurred the ludicrous incident of sewing up the hog's eyes. And I decided to include this tale in my autobiography when I was running for president almost 30 years later. The people in the East needed to know what kind of man I was. If they wanted to vote for the sort of man who would assist in sewing up the eyes of 30 hogs and then remove the stitching because a hog will not go anywhere blind, I reasoned I was their candidate. I took the hogs to New Orleans and sold them, and took apart the boat, and sold the lumber by the piece, and walked back to Illinois, where I decided to begin my life in great uncertainty, as if I were composing a verse, and found the empty page inspiring. Sorry. Ballad of Pigeon Creek, place in southern Indiana where Lincoln spent his adolescence. Twas summertime on Pigeon Creek, the fireflies lit the sky. I was a lonesome rhyming freak, born to the world to die. Verses were my buttered bread, repast of great delight, to fill my empty bucket head with rhyme to say and write. Declaiming I would find a stump and stand upon it tall, the word I think of now is bump. I cannot rhyme them all. The lasses were fair, the lads were strong, way down on Pigeon Creek. Inheritance was our lowly song. By God, we were the meek. Our schooling was a comedy, but I could pull the thread cut from the cloth of tragedy through all the books I read. 
and doing that is what I done as freely as the breeze and barefoot as a simple pun below the shady trees. But books were scarce on that old stream back in the way back when, and finishing one as in a dream, I'd start the book again. There isn't a chorus to this song, nor wisdom here to seek. It ends like the wind blowing along the banks of Pigeon Creek. When one is with strong wind oppressed, That's funny. <laughs> when one is with strong wind oppressed. Some of you might be in that condition right now. <laughs> Been sitting here a long time. <clears throat> Give me the spark of nature's fire. That's all the learning I desire. Though all the wisdom learning lends will never make amends for difficulties scatological. Windiness that's pathological. Though leaders toot, there's other fruit posterity must find. Sagely doodles left so silently behind or a smear of rhyme in broken time. Maybe to remind that constipation loosely rhymes with nation. <laughs> For the union I was knotted as T's are crossed and I's are dotted. How oft repairing to a dogged verse relieves the anguished human curse and certainly won't make it worse. So here's a toot for the USA, a living burden to my dying day. The audience, who are you people anyway? <laughs> Does hearing my voice from the dead disturb you? You're probably wondering what to make of this performance. I wonder too, but it doesn't matter to me. I'm dead, as dead as words writ on the page. You have to find the life in them. That is the pleasure of listening to a voice on the stage or reading a book. There's something alive you bring to life by being the reader or seeing the show, and that makes being alive less lonely. All of this expression has been for you. I beg your pardon, I had to pause for a moment to think of the proper word. I expect you know how difficult it is to get the words just right. Expression is too precise. It's better to think of this as a series of notes and meditations which by nature are incomplete. One of the things you have to accept in life and art are the parts left out, the missing pieces, and the simply inexplicable. What's missing says something by being absent. It is a gesture of the mind to leave it out, and then the gesture of another mind to grasp the absence. But once the absence it is grasped, it becomes a complicated emptiness. To fill it, we have the stage and books. But increasingly, I find that musing on the emptiness is pleasant enough, as when looking over a landscape, one can see where a tree has been, even a wilderness, and contemplate what might have happened, and imagine why. What else do you want from my countenance, from my exhausted face staring out? Three more, is that okay? Um, Madstone Alexanders. I was a superstitious son of a biscuit eater and couldn't abide robbing Paul to pay off Peter, so to speak, as a matter of principle. Yet, personal life was different concerning the boys, an extravagant wife. I was indulgent with them, protective, 
Whatever they needed, I provided, believing happiness when so well pleaded deserves my attention. Their delight gave me delight. And that was how I loved when alive. And now, in this night, I grasp the imperfection. But what else should one do? You love your people and do what love requires of you. If suddenly love's demand, love demands of body and mind, for example, going to the ends of the earth to find a primitive conjure woman who owns the only stone around imbued with healing powers for body and bone. I did it for my boy who was bitten by a dog and the stone prevented him from going mad. A fog, a total fog, recalling now such desperation and to think how desperately I also loved the nation. I was a father of boys and fathered ideas too. And stubbornly America, I fathered you. Belonging to the ages. I play in a play belonging to the ages in silences ringing out as if designed by a mind whose poetry is empty pages. The only player, too, on darkened stages, artistic in my way, though not refined, I play in a play belonging to the ages. But theaters are merely painted cages, rooms to watch imagination confined by a mind whose poetry is empty pages. In life, I borrowed lines from all the sages and found myself to airy nothings inclined to play in a play belonging to the ages. A tempest in this narrow house still rages as if the service of the dead is assigned by a mind whose poetry is empty pages. A house divided? Oh, formless form, whose wages must endlessly be paid, yet not divined. I play in a play belonging to the ages by a mind whose poetry is empty pages. Rail splitter. I was killed by an actor, a famous, glamorous young man known for playing the tragic roles. And I was a president whose face was coarse and enigmatic, though marked by a conscious mole. But the derringer he stuck behind my ear produced in the end a dark, symbolic whole, American and bottomless. No tears can fill it. Your Melville had the accurate verse, what like a bullet can undeceive? Hear, hear, the antique eloquence of the national curse. What an ironic martyr I've been. I'm long in a realm that has no ceilings though dying was worse. There is a mystery to being wrong, and that has darkened the shadows of my mind. Mainly, I mean, how I could like the song, away down yonder in the land of cotton, for rhyme. And what else should I call it but jauntiness? And ignore the euphemistic old times. Make up a song to cover sin, boundless and almost unimaginable sin. My task has been to stare it in the face, faceless though it is. We share a common dark. A mask is what we have. One voice and total silence and verse intended not to answer but ask the obvious question hanging in the distance of time. Who is that swinging on the gallows, my friends, united by love and innocence? And who is buried in those endless rows, 
those silent lines of American poetry where metaphors and muses refuse to go.